this new series called Family 360. Uh, we spoke last week about how do we, living in the Bay Area, uh, have a successful career, a work, and at the same time have a successful family without compromising one another. And we saw last week that the key to being successful in our workplace without compromising our family is really discovering uh, God's purpose, our purpose for our lives, and not, not working based on fear uh, or just for success, but working with a purpose that's bigger than ourselves so we can find uh, significance through our work, and that it is a freeing enterprise that it really will set us free to enjoy our work while at the same time giving ourselves to our family. So today we are going to move to the second part about marriage. You know, marriage is what is central in holding our families together. And I'm sure we have all sorts of people here as we asked you to do this exercise. Some of you who are really single, ready to mingle, and you're looking at what's the kind of a person that I need, whom I can get married to, what should I expect, how do I pick this person, you know, do I'm going to, am I going to do online dating or am I going to go the old school way of having my parents find someone or am I going to go on blind dates, you know, all those thoughts are bothering your mind or if you're younger, um, you're beginning to form an idea of marriage looking at your own parents and you, you, you are still trying to explore that. But for most people, who have been married for a few years, we all have a pretty same uniform path. You know, the initial married years were great, or should I say months, right? But then after the first few months, in five or six months, the romantic birds fly away. Uh, things start becoming not so very exciting anymore. You know, especially when you start seeing the darker side of the other person and all the romance levels start coming down and the irritations start coming up. And then when kids enter the scene, marriage takes on another different turn. Now, although you don't really appreciate one another, now you're saying, okay, just at least for the kids' sake, I got to make this marriage work. And I'm going to stick together, irrespective of what the other person is. So we don't really even address some of the issues that are underlying in our marriage. And then life goes on because we think we have to live for the sake of children. And when the children leave and we become empty nesters, statistics tell us many couples end up in divorce because marriage has not been lived for the sake of marriage. Also some statistics from the last 40 years in the United States, they've been tracking some leading marriage indicators, right? And this is, uh, uh, a good sign of what you can expect in some of the other developing countries because they usually follow suit. You know, whatever happens in America gets reproduced everywhere else, right? From McDonald's to marriages. And it's just a matter of time till we get affluent enough to have similar lifestyles and then all the social problems will follow. So they say the divorce rate in the United States is nearly twice the rate it was in 1960. And most telling part of it is that uh, in 1970, almost 90 percent of children were born to married parents, whereas in 2008, only 50 percent of children were born within marriage. And uh, in 1972, uh, 1960, 72 percent of marriageable uh, marry, uh, American adults were married. 72 percent. Whereas uh, in 2008, only 50% are married. People are beginning to lose faith in marriage. You know? So some of you are following uh, contemporary pop culture. Chris Rock, the comedian, he had a f funny one-liner. So he says, what are the options? Looking at the statistics, what do, what do young people think about marriage? So he asks the young people, do you want to be single and lonely or married and bored? That's the question that's staring younger people today. And uh, so what people venture on is to begin to experiment on marriage. They think, okay, let's try some new models, right? So half of all people 
nowadays live together before they get married. In 1960, virtually no one did. Can you believe that? This is in the United States. We're not talking about India, right? And, and one of the reasons behind this living together concept is because the assumption is most marriages are unhappy because you are told 50% of all marriages end up in the divorce and the other 50% are miserable. So why get married anyways? So let's just try living together is what drives people's thoughts. And they think if we live together, we'll see if our chemistry is working and then we'll be able to figure out um, if we are a good fit. And people who are long married and start experiencing trouble in their marriage also begin to think, oh, maybe we should have lived together before we got married, right? Then this might not be the case. Well, but here's the other side of uh, research that shows that a substantial body of evidence indicates that people who live together before marriage are the ones who are most likely to break up after marriage. Because irrespective of how you get married, whether you date, whether you live together, whether you're e-harmony or fixed, the history disappears the day you get married and our real self starts coming out. And, and although 45% of marriages end in divorce, the greatest percentage of divorces are actually happening to people who marry before the age of 18 or who have dropped out of high school you know, or who have had a baby before they get married. Those are the marriages that are breaking up. So if you are reasonably well-educated and come from a, a good home uh, with an intact family and you're making decent money and you're a very religious and godly family, and you marry after the age of 25 without having a baby first, your chances of getting divorced are very minimal. So all those statistics need to be taken with a pinch of salt. So in all these things that are before us, the question comes to us, where do I look to find a beautiful pattern for marriage? Where can I look to see how I could experience authentic, wonderful married life without sacrificing my career or whatever else I'm called to do. And, and the place we want to turn to is to see what is God's original blueprint or design for marriage, just like how we saw last week, what was God's original design for work. You know, and the passage we read today, if you have your Bibles, you can follow in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, we see, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone, I will make him a helper fit for him. You know, the Bible opens with marriage, and if you read through it, it ends with marriage. Marriage is a very godly thing, and, and God really places a lot of emphasis on marriage, not just places a lot of emphasis on marriage, he's the one who's officiating the very first wedding that's taking place between the very first human being. So obviously, he must have a lot to say. And, and we are going to look firstly to see that marriage was not a social evolutionary concept that people thought, okay, let's get married so that our property stays within our family or, you know, uh, we can uh, figure out a way to live healthily. It was actually God's idea. If marriage is God's idea, then we have to find from the one who gave the idea what was his design for marriage. And that's what we are going to look at.